Inadvertently, my talk did end up being more focused on the exploitation of young people in the workforce because I started from something that I had some experience with and felt that I knew a bit about. And then from there, it was interesting. I found that it did tie in to how women are exploited and the intersections of how age and gender, um, you know, how that can impact on how women and young people are ex exploited um, in the workforce. Um, so there are many issues facing um, young workers um, or young people trying to enter the workplace that don't just directly impact um, on young people but the broader working class as well. Um, the high rate of youth unemployment um, currently at 13.4% nationally, um, a largely casualised workforce, lack of knowledge um, about minimum working conditions and pay as well as being largely ununionized, um, results in an easily exploitable workforce, um, not just to their own detriment, but also the detriment of other workers. Um, many young people enter the workforce with no knowledge um, on appropriate or legal working conditions, which largely makes it difficult, if almost impossible, um, for young workers to speak up when issues um, arise in the workplace um, or to even realise um, when things aren't operating as they should be. Um, to start off with an example um, of my own personal experience working at McDonald's for two and a half years um, as a casual and a full-time employee, um, both at sort of the entry-level crew, um, crew member as it was called and crew trainer. Um, there was a significant amount of verbal abuse, um, both from the store owners and the store manager, um, usually directed towards the shift managers, but occasionally directly to the crew, crew members as well. Um, there were reports of physical abuse happening um, at other stores owned by the same people. Um, and something I did experience firsthand um, was being bullied about taking a workplace injury through um, the work cover process um, to the point where I didn't go ahead with the process um, and was just given a few days sick leave to recover from a repetitive stress injury that I had from work. The ideal worker um, was someone aged 18 to 19 um, because they'd finished school um, and they weren't on the full adult wages. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's still the case that full adult wage doesn't kick in until 20. Um, and I believe there's currently a campaign at the moment to lower that to 18 so that once someone turns 18, they're on full wage. I don't know if it's different in New South Wales, but that's what's happening in Victoria at the moment. And there was a tendency to push older casuals out. So as soon as you were 20 um, and you were on wage, they wanted to get rid of you. So they would start cutting your hours so you'd quit because they don't want you anymore. Um, and there was an expectation of volunteer unpaid work um, for McHappy Day, which is their big fundraising day that they have for their charity every year. Um, so, you know, all those activities, not that I suppose a lot of people here would frequent McDonald's, but if you went in on McHappy Day, there'd be stuff like face painting and people dressed as clowns. And a lot of that is staff there that have been expected to come in and volunteer and they're not getting paid for that work. Another more recent example um, that's been going around Facebook um, was an article released on a gaming website um, about similar events happening at EB Games, um, which is a popular retail outlet for console and PC games and merchandise. Many young people um, are interested, you know, in the gaming culture and would consider a position at EB Games to be the dream job. Like, it's something that a lot of people would aspire to be, like working at EB Games. Um, however, the article titled Inside EB Games, When the Dream Job Becomes a Nightmare, um, paints the picture of EB Games being anything but a dream job. Um, again, included verbal abuse, um, huge amounts of unpaid hours. So staff would come in, they were paid to work a four hour shift. They were there for 10 hours. Um, doing things like setting up displays, doing stock take. Um, there was expectation to come in for midnight launches. So when a new game comes out, EB does this midnight launch thing um, and most of the people in the store aren't paid to be there. 
Um, and it was all part of this culture in EB Games that you were friends, like you, you wanted to be there because you wanted to hang out with your friends and it, it wasn't treated as a job, it was a social thing. It was a way to exploit young people, basically. Um, there were instances of racism, um, people of colour being targeted and, you know, called useless, really horrendous stuff. Um, by the manager of EB Games in Wollongong, actually. So if you want to go in there and hassle them, you should do that. <laughs> um, there's a huge, huge push on KPI, so key performance indicators, um, and it's just an extremely sales-driven um, environment. Um, so in response to this article, um, EB has claimed that it follows all fair work <laughs> rules and regulations. Um, and states that all casuals are paid for the time that they work, including midnight launches. Um, however, a manager um, at EB Games has come out and said that it's a very well thought through system that she said whilst managers were never directly asked to ask their employees to come in and work for free, their budget for hours was deliberately set to be too low. So they couldn't actually cover the, the tasks or the jobs that needed to be done with that budget. So the only choice they had was to get their casuals to come in and work for free. Um, and interestingly enough, um, one of the EB employees that contributed to that article and put their name on it has since been banned from all EB game stores. Um, but uh, yeah, so unfortunately, this kind of practice um, is commonplace um, across the retail sector. Um, where a lot of those employed casual, um, so there's just a complete lack of job security um, and, you know, they have little to no knowledge about their rights at work. Um, and that's something that's, um, you know, made really clear in, in the instance of EB games. Like workers were told if they spoke up and said, you know, I want to be paid for these hours, they'd say, you're expendable. Like, do you know how many resumes are dropped in here on a daily basis? You don't like it? Fine, there's 20 people waiting to take your job. Um, so again, that's you know just that unspoken pressure or spoken pressure really to do what you're told or someone else will. Um, the other growing trend um, in terms of exploiting youth labour um, is the increase in unpaid internships um, or work experience um, that many u university graduates take on so they've got something um, attractive to put on their resume. Um, these graduates don't work any less um, than the paid staff. In fact, many of them would work the equivalent of full time um, or even longer to make a good impression um, in the hopes that putting in that extra effort will guarantee them a job, um, which isn't necessarily the case. And um, I guess the extreme instance um, of that, which was covered in Green Left recently, was um, a young worker in the US um, working for Goldman and Sachs and he worked I think something like 72 hours straight and dropped dead at his desk. Um, and then Goldman and Sachs did this massive inquiry, like three year inquiry into, into how it happened and you know denied all responsibility and um, but yeah so I guess you know that's the extreme end um, of where this goes. Um, and, you know, another, uh, another example um, is this ongoing trend in retail and hospitality for trial shifts as part of the recruitment process. So you're expected to come in and, and work a day or three to five hours or whatever. And again, it's, it's unpaid and you're not guaranteed any kind of job after that. Um, in addition to this, um, the, the placement hours that go along with TAFE diplomas and university degrees um, that is unpaid, um, something I've had first-hand experience with being a social work student. You, you're expected to do hundreds of hours of placement, full-time, six to seven weeks, um, and it's a course requirement. Um, so it makes it really hard for um, not, not so much younger students, but more mature age students that would possibly, you know, have kids. They've already got paid time employment. They're doing this course, you know, because you teach this course. Um, and you know, often they have to sacrifice their paid work to be able to do this placement um, that they're not getting paid for. Um, I think it's also worth noting um, how age and gender intersect in terms of exploitation in the workforce. Um, and according to ABS stats, the gender pay, cap, pay gap um, increases dramatically for women um, 
age between 24 and 45. So as soon as you turn 24, basically the, the, the pay discrepancy just go, like shoots up. Um, and presumably this is at a time when many women would you know, decide to have children and care for families. Um, similarly, the percentage of women working less than full-time hours, um, say the part-time or casual, decreases until um, the age of 20 and then continues to increase from there. Um, again, because the expectation that women are starting families or um, taking the larger share of staying at home to care for children um, as well as other domestic duties. Um, another issue affecting women in the workplace, um, particularly young women, is not just the hiring of their labour for a wage, um, but also, it's just an idea I'm trying to play with, but like also hiring their physical appearance um, as well as their personality and their emotions. So like there's this big trend in retail that you know, you're selling your personality, like that's how you get people to buy stuff. And you can tell like the best workers in retail all have this like cloned personality and it's, it's really bizarre. It's like Stepford Wives like <laughs> programming, it's really weird. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I've seen that particularly in retail and hospitality, but I imagine, you know, it would go across um, a number of different industries. Um, and I couldn't help wondering if, you know, another factor that impacts um, on the increase in the gender pay gap um, after a, wo a woman turns 24, um, women steadily become valued less um, as they get older, um, you know, due to this preference for mainstream standards of beauty, which is younger, bubbly women with these clone type personalities <laughs> that, that they're expected to have in the workforce. Um, and, you know, perhaps reading too much into it, but just a question to pose for people to think about, um, is I couldn't help but wonder if it's women's inexperience that is valued in the workplace. Um, that is another factor contributing to the pay gap. Um, when, you know, the pay gap is reduced when women are younger, more inexperienced, you know, more compliant, less questioning. Um, and as women get older and gain more experience and perhaps more confident, um, and, you know, because of that can start to play a leadership role, um, that their labour is suddenly devalued. Possibly another contributing factor, but um, I'll leave it there. <laughs>